Hi, I'm Mark. Today I'm going to talk about how a classic theorem from differential geometry can help us robustly parameterize meshes. Our goal is to compute high quality surface parameterizations. To do so, we employ what are called conformal cone flattenings, which offer both low angle and area distortion. The basic idea is that rather than directly optimizing a map from your mesh to the plane, you instead pick out a sparse set of cone vertices and intrinsically flatten the mesh away from these cones. This surface can then be easily cut open and laid out in the plane, yielding the final parameterization. The use of a conformal map reduces angle distortion, and careful cone placement reduces area distortion. After obtaining this parameterization, we can interpolate a texture across the original mesh. Now, why are we still talking about parameterization after all these years? For one thing, people want to parameterize some really challenging meshes these days. For another, while cones are essential for reducing area distortion and for generating high-quality quad meshes, they aren't handled by many classic algorithms. And there's currently no globally injective conformal mapping algorithm for the sphere, which is an essential tool for standardizing data in computational anatomy pipelines. We introduce a reliable algorithm for surface parameterization, which succeeds on low-quality input geometry, shown in blue, and difficult cone configurations, shown in pink. Furthermore, we also compute discrete conformal maps to the sphere, which we show in yellow. All three are made possible by a recent discrete uniformization theorem, which essentially states that any triangle mesh with any choice of cones can be parameterized by a map which is discretely conformal in an exact sense. However, even with this theorem in hand, there's still quite a lot of work that you need to do to apply it to meshes in practice. Our algorithm is a generalization of CETM. For those of you who know that paper, here's the difference. First, unlike the fixed triangulation CETM, we use Ptolemy flips to update our triangulation during optimization, which completely avoids the problem of violating the triangle inequality. To keep track of the correspondence between the original mesh and this mesh with flipped edges, we introduce a robust new data structure consisting of normal coordinates and roundabouts. Third, we propose a new interpolation scheme based on the light cone, which produces much better results than ordinary linear interpolation in this variable triangulation setting. Finally, we also treat spherical uniformization. We give the first algorithm that's guaranteed to compute an exact discrete conformal map to a convex sphere-inscribed polyhedron. I'll start by talking about optimization with Ptolemy flips. But before diving into the details, I first need to say what exactly I mean by discrete conformal map. In the smooth setting, conformal maps are often described as angle-preserving, and you could easily use the same definition on triangle meshes. However, this notion is far too strict. The only angle-preserving transformations that you can apply to a triangle mesh are global scalings and rigid motions. Luckily, there are many other characterizations of conformal maps which lead naturally to a variety of interesting algorithms. We take the metric scaling perspective here, which says that if you zoom in really close to some point in your domain, then a conformal map just scales this region up or down. Formally, a conformal map rescales the metric tensor G by some positive scale factor which we call e to the 2u to simplify some formulas. The analogous discrete notion is vertex scaling. Given a log scale factor u at each vertex, we scale each edge by the average of the u values at its endpoints. For example, here we set ui to be 1 and set u to 0 at all other vertices. Then all edges incident on i get longer, while other, all other edges remain the same length. While this definition appears simple, it's just flexible enough to lead to a rich mathematical theory capturing many of the desirable properties of smooth conformal maps. One of these important properties captured by vertex scaling is the uniformization theorem. In the smooth setting, the uniformization theorem guarantees that any surface can be conformally mapped to one of constant curvature. Amazingly, there's a discrete analog which similarly states that any valid vertex curvatures can be realized by some vertex scaling, no matter how wild the mesh is. In 2004, Luo gave a flow which takes in target curvatures on a mesh and evolves the scale factors until they achieve these desired curvatures. Luo observed that this flow is the gradient flow of a locally convex energy, which was then given in an explicit form by Springborn and colleagues in 2008. So essentially, you can find discrete conformal maps to the plane by simply minimizing some energy and then laying out the result. However, there's a big problem. This algorithm doesn't always work on a fixed mesh. The reason is that triangles can degenerate. If you make one edge of a triangle too long, then the other edges can't reach each other anymore, and these lengths don't define a valid triangle at all. In his original paper, Luo suggested handling this issue by flipping an edge at the moment when a triangle degenerates. However, these edge flips, shown as vertical lines in the plot, cause discontinuous jumps in the energy, voiding any guarantee that the flow will converge to a minimizer. Later, in 2018, Gu and colleagues proposed performing edge flips during the flow to maintain a Delaunay triangulation instead. These Delaunay flips keep the energy nice and continuous, C2 even, meaning that the flow will provably converge. However, this requires computing the exact time when the Delaunay condition is violated and pausing there to perform the necessary edge flips. We instead pursue an alternative strategy enabled by hyperbolic geometry. The main idea, proposed by Bobanko and colleagues in 2010, is to reinterpret our triangle mesh as an ideal hyperbolic polyhedron. Then, whenever we want to perform an edge flip, 
Instead of using the ordinary Euclidean formula, we compute the length of the flipped edge using this Ptolemy formula instead. If the two triangles share a common circumcircle, then this new length really is the Euclidean length of edge ij. However, in general, this new length will differ from the result of a standard edge flip, and we can even apply the Ptolemy formula in cases where the triangle inequality doesn't hold and the Euclidean edge flip is undefined. The important thing about these Ptolemy flips is that they're decoupled from vertex scaling. You can rescale and then flip, or flip and then rescale, or even rescale partway and then flip and then rescale the rest of the way, and you'll always get the same answer. This enables us to defer flips until they're absolutely necessary, rather than pausing our flow to flip exactly when the Delaunay condition is first violated. In order to explain where these Ptolemy flips come from, I'll have to introduce a little bit of hyperbolic geometry. The hyperbolic plane is a surface that's saddle-shaped at each point. Formally, we say it has constant Gaussian curvature minus 1. In order to study the hyperbolic plane, mathematicians use various models, in the same way that cartographers use various map projections to illustrate different features of the Earth. The important models now will be the Poincaré inclined disks, although the hyperboloid model will also play a key role later. The Poincaré disk provides a really instructive picture of the hyperbolic plane. It compresses the entire infinite hyperbolic plane into the unit disk. In order to make everything fit, distances near the boundary get scaled enormously. Points on the boundary itself, known as ideal points, represent points at infinity. Three ideal points connected by geodesics define an ideal triangle. These triangles have a number of odd properties. For example, each of their edges is infinitely long, but we can still glue these ideal triangles together to make what are called ideal hyperbolic polyhedra. These polyhedra also have infinite edge lengths. To make it easier to talk about them, we can cut off their tips of vertices using what are called horospheres, depicted as spheres tangent to the boundary. This leaves behind segments of finite length which describe the polyhedron. Note that since there are many different horospheres we could pick, there are many sets of lengths which encode the same polyhedron. Amazingly, it turns out that any triangle mesh defines an associated ideal polyhedron. For this, we need to move to another model, the Beltrami-Klein model, which is very similar to the Poincaré disk except the geodesics appear as straight lines. Hence, ideal triangles look just like ordinary Euclidean triangles enclosed by a circle. So given any ordinary triangle mesh, we can take each triangle and draw its circumcircle around it to obtain an ideal triangle in the Beltrami-Klein model. If we attach all these ideal triangles together, we obtain an associated ideal polyhedron. And moreover, the edge lengths of the mesh gave us a particular choice of horospheres at the vertices of this ideal polyhedron. This hyperbolic perspective leads naturally to a notion of discrete conformal equivalence beyond the fixed triangulation version that I gave earlier. From a naive Euclidean perspective, there are some scale factors that are disallowed. If you use them to scale your mesh's edge lengths, you violate the triangle inequality and get stuck with invalid geometry. However, we can use the hyperbolic perspective to interpret such scale factors in a valid way. On the hyperbolic side, vertex scaling simply corresponds to shifting horospheres, making some bigger and others smaller. But no matter which horospheres we end up with, they always encode the same valid ideal polyhedron. So we can flip to a hyperbolic Delaunay triangulation using hyperbolic edge flips. With this in hand, we then pass back to the Euclidean setting and obtain a valid Euclidean triangulation. If you stay on the Euclidean side the whole time, then this procedure just looks like scaling to an invalid set of edge lengths and then flipping back to Delaunay using Ptolemy flips instead of ordinary Euclidean flips. And moreover, this mesh that we end up with is the same mesh that we would have obtained if we'd stopped during scaling to maintain a Delaunay triangulation the entire time. With Ptolemy flips in our toolbox, optimization becomes fairly straightforward. We have formulas for our energy and its gradient in Hessian in terms of the edge length of a mesh. Whenever we want to evaluate this energy or its derivatives at a particular scale factor u, we simply scale our original edge lengths by u, obtaining a set of possibly invalid Euclidean lengths. We then flip to Delaunay using Ptolemy flips anyway and evaluate the desired formula. This defines a twice continuously differentiable energy, which we can hand off to any optimization algorithm. One remaining complication with the optimization is that you actually need to flip the input mesh to its intrinsic Delaunay triangulation before doing any of this. As a simple example, consider a flat mesh of the disk. If we directly apply the optimization procedure, it'll actually produce non-zero scale factors which distort the mesh in the plane, even though it started out flat already. On the other hand, if we first flip to an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, then the optimization correctly concludes that the optimal scale factors are all zero. As a less trivial example, here's a low quality mesh. Again, we see that if we feed the non-Delaunay input into the optimization, we get a distorted mapping to the plane, whereas if we first flip to Delaunay, we obtain a nice parameterization. One other beneficial consequence of this preprocessing step is that it makes our output canonical, independent of the particular triangulation used as input. For example, here's a polygonal mesh of a frog. No matter how we triangulate it to feed it into our algorithm, it always has the same intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, so we always obtain the same parameterization as output. 
Note, though, that now we have to ke keep track of three triangulations throughout. The input mesh, its intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, and the varying triangulation used during optimization. Now I'll discuss the data structures that we developed to keep track of this correspondence between triangulations. I'll focus mostly on the case of two triangulations here for simplicity. It's important to emphasize that all of the edge flips that I've been discussing are intrinsic edge flips. We allow edges to run along the surface of the mesh. Although the resulting triangles don't look flat in 3D space, they're intrinsically flat, meaning that we could lay them flat in the plane. The geometry of such intrinsic triangles is determined by their edge lengths. One last note is that in order to flip to Delaunay triangulations, we have to allow our mesh to be a general delta complex, meaning that edges from a vertex to itself or multiple edges between a pair of vertices could arise, like the highlighted pair of edges between I and J on this octahedron. The geometry of an intrinsic triangulation is determined purely by its edge lengths, but this geometry alone is not sufficient for us. We also need to know how the intrinsic triangulation sits over the input mesh. Unfortunately, existing schemes for correspondence tracking are inadequate for our purposes. The overlay mesh of Fisher and colleagues explicitly stores all intersections between triangulations, which gets very complicated and computationally expensive in our setting where there are three of them. On the other hand, the signpost data structure of Sharp and colleagues relies essentially on floating point, which can become inaccurate in the complex hyperbolic triangulations that we encounter. We develop a new implicit encoding based only on integer data, which always encodes the correct correspondence. I should note that the fact that we don't have to track all intersections explicitly is thanks again to the hyperbolic picture, as the edges that we track follow hyperbolic geodesics along the input mesh. Our integer encoding is comprised of normal coordinates and what we call roundabouts. It fully determines the geometry of intersections between two triangulations and is easy to update after an edge flip. Normal coordinates are a well-established tool from geometric topology. The basic idea is that you can encode a curve along a triangulated surface simply by counting how many times it crosses each edge. So long as your curve satisfies a few simple requirements, these counts uniquely determine the curve up to homotopy. We diverge from the standard setting a bit and consider instead geodesic triangulations along polyhedral surfaces. In this case, the normal coordinates actually determine the exact geometry of our curves, and we derive a new formula for performing edge flips in this setting. The basic operation that we apply to normal coordinates is tracing out a curve along a mesh. In each face, the normal coordinates uniquely determine the connectivity of the curves. That is to say, each edge has some number of crossings along it, and in each face we can tell which crossings connect to each other. Using this, we can trace out the connectivity of any curve by stepping triangle by triangle until we determine the whole triangle strip that it passes through. Note that this connectivity is guaranteed to be correct, as it depends only on integer data. We can then lay this triangle strip out in the plane, and simply connect the endpoints by a straight line to determine the geometry of the curve. Now, after tracing, there's still a problem. We don't know which edge of the other triangulation this curve corresponds to. Remember that we're working with delta complexes, so the endpoints of an edge don't determine it uniquely. If we trace out a curve between vertices i and j in this octahedron, for example, we can't immediately tell which of the two highlighted edges it corresponds to. To solve this problem, we introduce some new data, which we call roundabouts at vertices. These encode which edge each trace curve corresponds to by recording the cyclic ordering of edges around each vertex. And again, these are easy to update following an edge flip. The addition of normal coordinates and roundabouts only requires a small change to the overall algorithm. We still begin by solving an optimization problem to find our scale factors, but now, whenever we perform an edge flip, we have to update our normal coordinates and roundabouts in addition to updating our edge lengths. Then, once we've found the optimal scale factors, we can trace out mesh edges to determine the explicit correspondence between our input and flipped triangulations. The only remaining task is to use this correspondence to interpolate our texture coordinates across the input mesh. I'll discuss our interpolation scheme now. In 2008, Springborn and colleagues showed that in the fixed triangulation setting, you can get smoother maps by performing what's called projective interpolation rather than standard linear interpolation. However, it's not obvious how to perform this projective interpolation across several triangulations. We introduce a new algorithm for variable triangulation projective interpolation based on the hyperboloid model of hyperbolic space. Unsurprisingly, the hyperboloid model identifies the hyperbolic plane with the unit hyperboloid. This hyperboloid asymptotically approaches a cone, known as the light cone, whose rays represent ideal points of the hyperbolic plane. Ideal triangles appear again as triangles with curved edges, but this time their edges really do go off to infinity. One really useful thing about the hyperboloid model is that we can take any point within the light cone and normalize it so that it lies on the hyperboloid. Going the other direction, we can take all the points on some ideal triangle and scale them so they lie along a Euclidean triangle inscribed in the light cone. This correspondence between an ideal and Euclidean triangle is essentially the same correspondence that we introduced earlier via the Beltrami-Klein model. Performing vertex scaling on such a triangle simply slides its vertices up and down along the light cone. 
In the fixed triangulation setting, each triangle in the input mesh gets rescaled to obtain a corresponding triangle in the final mesh. If we place both triangles in the light cone, they lie above the same ideal triangle. So we can take any point x on the input triangle and simply scale it to obtain a point x tilde on the final triangle. This mapping between triangles is then precisely the projective map introduced by Springborn and colleagues. But now in the variable triangulation setting, we can do exactly the same thing. For example, if we perform vertex scaling and also flip an edge, we can simply place both triangle pairs in the light cone and scale points to map between them. This defines a piecewise projective map on the common subdivision of the two meshes. Now I'll briefly discuss our fourth and final contribution, a full algorithm for spherical uniformization. So far I've been discussing cone flattenings, but we can also apply all this machinery to map genus zero surfaces to the sphere. More explicitly, given any genus zero triangle mesh, we compute a discretely conformally equivalent polyhedron which is convex and inscribed in the unit sphere. The main idea, given by Springborn in 2019, is as follows. We begin by removing a vertex from the input mesh, leaving us with a topological disk. We map that disk to a convex polygon in the plane, which we then stereographically project onto the sphere. We conclude by adding the removed vertex back into the north pole, yielding the desired sphere-inscribed polyhedron. The main difficulty lies in mapping our disk to the plane, which we do by solving an optimization problem similar to the one we use for cone flattening. However, this time the optimization is more complicated, as we need to impose bounds constraints on the log scale factors. One detail about the algorithm that I found particularly interesting is that along the way, we need to compute single source geodesic distance on an ideal polyhedron. It turns out that in the hyperbolic setting, there's an algorithm for computing these distances just by flipping to Delaunay. Finally, I should mention that this spherical uniformization algorithm depends essentially on the hyperbolic perspective. Previous methods, which focused on the Euclidean perspective, could not guarantee success. Now, some results. We evaluated our algorithm on several challenging datasets. We tested cone flattening on MPZ and Thingy10K, and spherical uniformization on brain scans and other anatomical surfaces. We successfully produced locally injective discrete conformal maps on all models, with the exception of Thingy10K where we achieved a 97.7% success rate due to floating point issues on a few of the most degenerate models. The code was generally fast, often finishing a matter of seconds, although it took up to several minutes on a few of the large brain scans, and up to half an hour on some of the most challenging Thingy10K inputs. We found that Ptolemy flips provide a definite performance benefit, often providing a 2x speedup on MPZ, for example. On models with poorly conditioned triangles, we find that our projective interpolation provides a huge improvement over ordinary linear interpolation. And even on models where the fixed triangulation CETM succeeds, our variable triangulation method and novel interpolation can produce much smoother results than fixed triangulation projective interpolation. I should mention that we can also specify target curvatures or scale factors on mesh boundaries, mirroring the degrees of freedom of smooth conformal maps. The key idea is to make two copies of the mesh and glue them along the boundary, resulting in a symmetric closed surface without boundary. Finally, on multiply connected domains, that is domains with holes in them such as this car, the basic uniformization procedure may produce a mesh that must be cut to lay it out in the plane, as on the left. It's often desirable to compute a continuous texture map instead. We observe that you can simply triangulate any holes in your domain before computing a conformal flattening. This ensures that the resulting map to the plane will be continuous, and thanks to the robustness of our method, you don't have to be very careful when triangulating these gaps. Here, for instance, we simply insert a new vertex in the middle of each hole and connect it to each boundary vertex. Now, some limitations on future work. Although the discrete uniformization theorem guarantees that our algorithm works in exact arithmetic, floating point can be a problem in extreme cases. An investigation of higher precision schemes can be found in the concurrent work of Campin and colleagues. Second, the use of variable triangulations is what allows our method to be so robust, and indeed plenty of cone configurations are impossible to achieve without changing the triangulation. On the other hand, it may be undesirable that we output texture coordinates on a refined mesh rather than the input mesh itself. However, this refined mesh can be treated as a standard mesh in downstream applications, and furthermore, we also produce a sparse matrix, allowing the user to interpolate any other data from the input mesh to this refined output. Nonetheless, it would be interesting to investigate schemes to simplify the output mesh, perhaps by trying to unflip any edges that were flipped during optimization. And finally, if you only care about computing locally injective maps rather than full conformal maps, then you don't need to flip to intrinsic Delaunay at the beginning of our algorithm. There may be other possible optimizations in this setting too. Thank you for listening.